The next session is about to begin, so please go ahead and take your seats. Good afternoon. My name is Eric Johnson, and I'm a 2014 Aspen Security Forum Scholar. I'm here to introduce the next session, The View from the West Wing. The President's Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor gives us a peek into how the Oval Office sees the global threat picture and the administration's strategy for addressing it. The session will be moderated by Margaret Warner, Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent for PBS NewsHour. As lead correspondent for the program's Overseas Reporting Unit, she makes multi-week reporting trips to the world's hotspots at critical moments, most recently to Crimea, Eastern Ukraine, and Kiev. Her overseas reporting has won her both an Emmy and the Edward Wenthal Prize for International Reporting. And with that, the floor is yours, Margaret. Thank you so much. And I want to associate myself with David Sanger, who is, as he said, particularly grateful that we have such a good crowd on a beautiful Saturday afternoon here in Aspen, but I'm not surprised given our guests. Uh, Lisa Monaco, who came to the job as the Counterterrorism and Homeland Security Advisor to the President from a long history in law enforcement. She had two very significant early mentors, both Janet Reno and Bob Muller, and ended up just before this job, you took it in what, January 2013? March, but yeah. March 2013. Um, you were in the job that John Carlin is now at the Justice Department. So I know you just arrived last night, but there have been a lot of themes that have emerged here that really it was amazing consensus on. And I, I have to say there's, it's not a pretty picture. It's a picture of a world in which the old threat seems to have been somewhat managed, but that it is a much more complex, diffuse, interconnected threat matrix that poses all kinds of new challenges. And so I thought maybe we'd just jump right into that. And the number one that we've just heard in panel after panel is the growth of these ungoverned spaces, ungoverned spaces that ultimately, of course, can prove a threat to the homeland. And the number one example was this area now, what, 350 square miles in Iraq and this whole area in eastern Syria, controlled by whether you call it ISIL, ISIS, or the Islamic State. Do you consider the growth of that area and the territory they now control a threat to the homeland? I do, uh, and I do for several reasons. Um, perhaps not uh, on the most immediate or imminent level, but uh, for what it portends. Anytime, and I'm sure the, uh, the experts who've been on this stage before me over the last couple of days uh, have remarked, anytime where you have space, freedom of movement, ungoverned spaces, as, as you've mentioned, safe havens, call it what you will, freedom of movement for extremists um, is going to concern people in my job. So was the administration surprised by the taking of Mosul, for example? Look, I think um, our intelligence community has done a tremendous work uh, uh, over uh, many years, uh, not just in Iraq, but around the world. Uh, I think uh, what you saw uh, in Mosul was uh, a, a kind of a dramatic uh, escalation of ISIL, ISIS, Islamic State, call it what you will, um, uh, ability to take and hold ground. And that's going to be the most concerning thing. And it's the type of thing that's going to uh, be uh, their greatest goal, which is, of course, to establish a caliphate. But for instance, was the administration too blasé? And that's, of course, such a pejorative word, so I don't really mean it that way, but about the taking of Raqqa. I mean, ISIS has been controlling Raqqa now and governing there for, what, a year? Um, and the attitude, it seemed to be, was, well, they'll burn themselves out, they'll alienate the local population, uh, let's focus on the, on the Free Syrian Army and the moderate forces. In retrospect, weren't they establishing a beachhead there? Look, I think it, it's clear they've made, they've made gains there, but I think it's also important to remember that ISIS uh, and ISIL um, got pushed out 
uh, of Syria now uh, also uh, wended its way back to Iraq. So I think it's a very, very complicated picture. Uh, and what is clear is the brutality of the Assad regime uh, and what it has done there has been a magnet, a magnet to extremists. And the thing that I'm most concerned about, and again, I think you've heard uh, probably um, many times over the course of the last few days, is the unprecedented number of uh, foreign fighters right. flowing into that space, um, off the charts to anything we saw at the height of the Iraq war. And the particularly concerning thing, uh, of course, is unlike with the Fatah, the proximity of this space, the borderless nature of it, the proximity of it to Turkey, to Europe, and frankly, to then being an e-ticket away to the homeland right. is the thing that I'm going to be most focused on. So as Mike Vickers, the Under Secretary for Intelligence at DOD said, and many others have said in the last couple of days, of course, the only counterweight to something like that are local partners. That, that's <clears throat> part of the Obama doctrine. But when you're in a country like Iraq and certainly Syria right now where you don't have local partners um, that are effective, certainly not in Syria, in retrospect, if you knew then, when you came into this job, what you know now, or if we took it back to mid-2012, would you have been an advocate for arming the Free Syrian Army as flawed as it was, as dominated by exiles, we know all of their problems, but in retrospect, would it have been better for this administration to have beefed up that force? Look, I think you can do a lot of um, kind of Monday morning quarterbacking on uh, that situation. What is true is we have provided a great deal of assistance to the uh, moderate opposition, and indeed um, uh, the United States has been the galvanizing force to uh, and among uh, Syria's neighbors, whether it's the Saudis, the Jordanians, the Turks, to provide assistance to the moderate opposition. Uh, and to uh, try and form a cohesive unit there. Now, we've made, we've made some progress, but there's a lot more work to do, which is exactly what the president talked about in his West Point speech. I mean, in terms of lethality, any member of the FSA will tell you, and I'm not just, I'm talking about fighters on the ground as well as their leadership, that, you know, they just didn't have the firepower, they didn't have the training, they didn't have the weapons, and these young hotheads who are attracted to come and fight for this cause against this secularist, Alawite, apostate, you know, Assad, they want to be on a winning side. They want to be on a, on a team that's actually out there kicking ass. And so that's the team they joined, yeah. including some Syrians who didn't originally, you know, philosophically or, or religiously ascribe to their point of view, but they want to be you know, on the team that's going to win the Super Bowl. I, and the U.S., I mean, wouldn't you say the U.S. definitely has not given the FSA that kind of assistance? Well, again, we have given it quite a bit of assistance, and more is coming. And you saw a request going uh, to the Hill, uh, which we hope uh, the Congress will act on, uh, to provide further assistance and to enable us to work with our partners, because this is not going to be done uh, unilaterally, right? This has got to be what we need to create is, in essence, a counterterrorism platform. And by that, I mean an architecture across that region that's going to take military, political, diplomatic, intelligence, law enforcement. That whole structure, frankly, needs to be uh, constructed uh, in a way uh, that we haven't done before. But you don't think, and I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but that, as Robert Ford said when he retired as, or left as ambassador to Syria, that we're always a day late, we're always a dollar short. I mean, the 500 million the president's asked for is a pittance compared to, I don't, can't remember who said it here, but a million dollars a day now that ISIS makes off oil revenues, they're running oil refineries. I mean, they're even outside the normal channels of terrorist financing that we used to be so good at frustrating, right? Using the international banking system or even the informal one. Um, what, the aid's not gonna arrive till next year? Well, now let's be clear. There was 500 million that was requested for a uh, overt uh, train and equip right. program for the military to run. There was $5 billion right. that was requested uh, for counterterrorism partnerships throughout that region to uh, address the, the really just horrific destabilizing effects of the refugee flows uh, to Jordan, to Lebanon, to Turkey, uh, but also uh, to build partnerships with other um, uh, 
governments in the region, and frankly, we can't forget uh, northern Iraq and, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, northern Africa and the Maghreb, where we're doing things like assisting the French, providing logistic support to address another safe haven, quite frankly, in northern Mali. Uh, but, back to, but back to the one, the ISIS-controlled one or ISIL-controlled one, I mean, do you really think, I mean, do you have a strategy for dealing with them on the ground in some way without getting American boots on the ground, hobbling their ability to work? Yeah, and I think it's exactly what the president talked about in his West Point speech. And again, you can't look at these things in isolation. And as you've said, Sir the arc between Syria and Iraq, the flow of fighters, right. money, weapons um, uh, that ISIL is making use of, that has got to be addressed first and foremost by the Iraqis, and we've sent 300 plus um, uh, military forces in there, both to protect our people, which is first and foremost our responsibility, protect our people in the US Embassy there, and to assess what are the capabilities, what are the best units that we can work with in the Iraq security forces to, uh, to take the fight to ISIL. You know, at last night's dinner that some of us went to at Jane Harmon, so interesting side conversations, and I won't quote anyone since everyone had had a glass of wine, or some of margarita. Then I was I hoped you would <laughs> I, quote some. I'm sorry you missed it. But there was a conversation among a number of knowledgeable people about how really President Obama will leave office having gotten out of Afghanistan, gotten out of Iraq, probably, sort of. Uh, but this is now going to be a problem for the next president. This isn't going away soon. The next president's going to be faced with have we done enough there to hobble this caliphate, or this caliphate wannabe? Or in fact, is America going to have to get militarily re-engaged? Do you all talk about that in Absolutely. the inner councils? That, Absolutely. That there's a whole new festering problem being created here? Yeah, I mean, I think when you, how we think about it is, you've seen a number of different strands, right? Sunni extremism in the form of um, anti-Western uh, and homeland plotting and the like. You've seen the rise of uh, the Arab street in response to the Arab Spring. Uh, but you've seen, and I think all three arguably are present in Iraq, uh, and the, the last piece here is the really heightened sectarian violence. Mm -hmm. And that really is what is first and foremost what's going on uh, in Iraq. But arguably, you're seeing all three manifestations in Iraq and Syria. And that um, very uh, certainly is the, is the thing we've got to deal with in the immediate, medium, and the long term. So you referred to the problem of the foreign fighters. I think the new 9-11 Commission report, we've heard a lot, a lot of numbers here the last couple of days, but said there were 1,000 foreign fighters at least in the Syria-Iraq region. Uh, uh, in the four digits are Europeans with Western mm -hmm. passports and 100 Americans. What's the strategy, the near-term strategy, for dealing with that? Look, I'm telling you, this is the, um, the thing that keeps our counterparts in Europe um, uh, up at night. Uh, everyone I talk to, my counterparts in England and France and Turkey and other places that are most kind of on the front lines of this, this is what they are most seized with. Our strategy is um, uh, several fold. First and foremost, we've got to do better at sharing information amongst those governments uh, so that we can also assist some of those governments, particularly the Turks, in uh, doing what we've done a good job of over the years, which is identifying foreign fighters of concern and identifying them, frankly, before they get on a plane. Yeah, because there are a lot of them on those planes. Yep. So sharing information, building up that infrastructure, right. building up those partnerships, uh, deploying and assisting our partners uh, in using some of the cutting edge technology uh, and intelligence tools that we have to uh, address the foreign fighter problem. Uh, those are, those are gonna be the first line of defense in keeping those folks from coming to the homeland. This is more of an organizational question, because that's been another theme of this conference, is that the, uh, the sort of structure with which we deal with national security uh, and homeland security really is back from the 19, 1947, post-war. And we'll get more into that later, but here's a very specific one. Both you and Jay Johnson, the Secretary of Homeland Security, say this whole Syria, ISIS, ISIL, Iraq problem is now a homeland security problem. Was homeland security at the table when Syria policy was being decided? 
when the policy about whether to aid the rebels sooner, the moderate rebels sooner, were you or your counterparts even at the table? Um, well, kind of reaching back into my uh, history before mm -hmm. I got to this job. Uh, the Justice Department is certainly at the table. Um, I think the Homeland Security Department is at the table. But I can tell you that the Homeland Security Department is at the table in all of these discussions about our um, Syria policy and our foreign fighter policy. Absolutely. And that's been true all along? That's been true as long as I've been in this job. Because so. President Obama said he wanted to eliminate the distinction between national security and homeland security. But do you feel that's, been, that's happened? Uh, I think in that, an organizational, sort of bureaucratic yeah. way. I, I think that um, my job uh, and the uh, where I work is the embodiment of that. Now, have we, have we gotten it 100% right? No. But um, my title, Homeland Security and Counterterrorism, mm -hmm. um, uh, means I am dealing with everything from pathogens to cybersecurity to uh, domestic terrorist activity to international terrorist activity. And that bespeaks the fact that these things are increasingly uh, intertwined. Are you satisfied with the way that integration is taking place, or do you think that more could be done? I think we can always do more to make sure that we're identifying um, all the potential ramifications to the homeland. That's my job, right? Every, I'm thinking constantly, my core mission is thinking, how is this threat, whatever it is, a bio threat, a cyber threat, a terrorism threat, how is it going to manifest itself here or against US persons overseas? That is my singular focus. And I think that was the rationale behind the creation of this position. It was the rationale behind um, what President Obama did uh, early in 2009, which say, let's take a full-scale look at how the Homeland Security staff and National Security staff, which at that time were distinct entities, how can they work better together? And the decision was made to uh, integrate those staffs, but retain accountability and responsibility in uh, one individual uh, for that Homeland focus. And do you have the staffing that's necessary to fulfill that dual function, or are you still dependent on more stoved pipe staffs, each of which is in its own straw stovepipe? Well, whatever. it's interesting. I think um, what I've heard from my colleagues at the National Security Council staff who were there um, in past administrations say that um, uh, the single point of growth in the uh, US government has been in the National Security Council staff. Yes, so, um, uh, so I think we've got a tremendous team. Um, and uh, the homeland security element of it, folks who are dealing with trans-border threats, folks who are dealing with uh, ensuring that we are, uh, have a resilient infrastructure and capabilities to deal with everything from natural disasters to uh, bio threats. Uh, to those who are looking at cybersecurity. That is all an integrated staff sitting under me and under mm -hmm. Susan Rice. Now, the top military person from the administration, the Joint Chiefs Chairman Martin Dempsey, was here the other night. And in talking about the Iraq and Syria situation, but particularly the Iraq situation, um, and reflecting this sort of Obama doctrine, which is no American boots on the ground, we look for our, a partner has to be capable and willing partner. And every question about what was going to happen in Iraq got back to getting the Iraqi government and Maliki, who despite five years of being jawboned by everyone from Joe Biden on down, <laughs> has refused to do it, to, to agree to an inclusive government. I mean, is that the one card on the table? And what if that doesn't work? So first and foremost, uh, you're quite right. We're very focused on getting a government there with whom uh, is going to, who is going to be a capable uh, partner. I will say uh, the Iraqi government um, uh, has uh, asked for and received a great deal of assistance from the United States government, uh, and increasingly over the last year uh, to, um, uh, to help it address uh, the threat from ISIL. But that's uh, military assistance military assistance as well as um, uh, political and economic and other assistance. It's mm -hmm. got to be a holistic uh, approach, which I suspect is something that the chairman also said. Um, so a inclusive government uh, is first and foremost going to be uh, the best ingredient to that capable and willing partner. However, 
uh, from a counterterrorism perspective, from a security perspective, we've got to be able um, to uh, work with partners in the region uh, if to combat that threat if, in fact, we don't end up with a Iraqi government that is as inclusive as we'd like to see it. So you are developing a plan B. Yes. Would you like to share it here? You could make news. I could. <laughs> and oddly, I, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that, but I wanted to give you the opportunity. And I it's a Saturday. Yeah. Not much Nothing going else on going in the on. world. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, Afghanistan. How concerned is the administration that as, as the U.S. prepares to take out its forces, we've got this very big U.S. trained military. We heard some positive words about their ability to lead missions now. But that, again, the politics may break down. And when the politics break down and the country splits along factional sectarian lines, that once again, militarily it will break down and that you are going to have a situation in which the country will fragment and the, in this case, the Taliban will move back in. In other words, has the Iraq experience of the last six months caused you to reassess the plans for Afghanistan and the expectations? So the, the president was quite clear uh, about uh, the plan for Afghanistan. Um, and we are working very hard, and Secretary Kerry, as you've seen in the last mm -hmm. uh, couple of weeks, um, uh, in his indefatigable way, uh, was, uh, was off in Afghanistan um, uh, trying to uh, assist the parties there uh, with the uh, election uh, issues. Um, so the focus there first is to transition, as we have done right. over the last um, uh, several years, to uh, have the Afghan people in a place and the Afghan security forces in a place where they can take control. And increasingly, they have been doing no, that. And General Allen told us that. He yep. thought they were there. But, but, but the political, you know, the, the news story in the Times today is that the Kerry deal is, is of two weeks ago is mm -hmm. fraying at the seams again. Um, I, I'm just wondering if you have, it's more how you all operate inside. In other words, you say, ooh, look what happened in Iraq. Do we need to go back and rethink what we're doing in Afghanistan and how we approach it? Well, I think the, the principles are the same. One is, first and foremost, responsibility for the governance and security for, should be the Afghan people's. Second is, we are, and we've uh, laid out a plan, the President's laid out a plan, to uh, continue to have forces there to do two missions. One, train and advise and assist the military there, but uh, as important, if not more so, to be able to conduct counterterrorism operations. And that's what we're going to do because we are not going to stay there in perpetuity, as the President has said, and remain on a permanent war footing. So what's happened in Iraq is not an aha moment vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan. I think what it tells us, no, I don't think it's an aha moment. What I think it tells us is uh, we have to continue uh, to um, bear down on working with and finding uh, and nurturing capable and willing partners, because we are not going to be able to do this unilaterally. So more than you did perhaps in Iraq once U.S. forces left? More, stay more engaged than you did in Iraq once U.S. forces left? Well, we've been very engaged, as, and as you've said, there's been, uh, I don't think there's anybody who's been more engaged on the phones with the Iraqi leadership uh, than Vice President Biden. No. Um, and we've had an extremely able and continue to have an extremely able um, uh, ambassador and presence there. Um, but the Iraq uh, government did not want our forces to stay. That was, that was clear, and that was true. Um, notwithstanding that, we continued to work with them on a political level and continue to provide assistance where they have sought it and where we've been able to provide it. And of course, Senator McCain disputes whether he did or didn't want to, but believe we've all heard that argument many a time. <laughs> uh, but it, would you say bottom line is it hasn't been effective uh, on the political level, that Maliki has, has resisted all? There, there's no question that uh, he has not um, taken the steps to, uh, towards inclusivity that we have wanted him to take. And in large measure, um, that is, we're seeing uh, the fruits of that um, in the Sunni extremist violence that has, um, that has increased over the last several months. 
So new topic, new, fairly new event, Ukraine. Um, not that Ukraine and Russian actions in Ukraine is brand new, but mm. certainly the shooting down of the airliner by a non-state, someone today described it as a sub-state actor, <laughs> using Russian-made equipment. Uh, what homeland security ramifications does that raise to you? So uh, it's a lot of um, uh, discussion around that um, topic and some of the aviation incidents that we've seen. Um, I think what it uh, reinforces is obviously the danger of weapons um, transiting borders to uh, unstable actors. Now, in this instance, as I think we've said quite clearly, we believe this was uh, conducted, this shoot down was conducted with an SA-11, um, which is uh, capable of uh, shooting down an airliner operating at the, um, uh, at the altitude that this one was, some 30,000 feet, uh, and so was not uh, a man pad, which is the, uh, the type of aviation security issue you're going to be concerned about. But the bottom line is uh, the transiting and porousness of a border in an unstable uh, uh, and potentially ungoverned space, here again back to our theme, uh, is going to potentially pose uh, homeland security uh, and U.S. person security issues because um, now there was one dual U.S. and Dutch national on that plane, there might well have been more. Mm -hmm. But does it also suggest to you that, that the, there is a proliferation or the danger of proliferation of that kind of lethal weapon worldwide? Or do you consider it a kind of one-off specific circumstance involving a very powerful military power, the Russians, and their designs on a former republic? Yeah. I, I I would tend to see it as more of a uh, situation that is unique to that particular mm -hmm. conflict. Now, of course, we had the uh, Air Algiers flight uh, that was downed uh, a couple of days ago. And of course, everyone's first thoughts, particularly right. in that part of the world and over Mali, uh, and given the uh, porousness of those borders um, and weaponry flowing out of Libya, uh, the first thought is towards manpads. Now, it looks like that was a function of uh, some really horrible weather and that that was a tragedy. Uh, prompted not from man-made means, but um, the the Ukrainian um, shoot down, I think, or I should say, the shoot down of the MH17 uh, aircraft uh, from uh, Russian separatist-controlled territory is, I think, unique to that situation. Now, General Dempsey said the other night that certainly the military was developing at least plans or options for the president in terms of greater assistance, greater lethal assistance for the U Ukrainian military. So how seriously is the president weighing that? Weighing giving them what they'll tell, they tell all of us they want, which is not just intelligence sharing and their meals ready to eat or bulletproof vests or night vision goggles, but they need anti-aircraft equipment, weaponry to shoot down and to, first of all, to detect in real time these missiles and to shoot them down. So, uh, look, the president's going to carefully consider um, any options that are presented to him, but I think um, the, uh, there is a real concern with the proliferation and the potential misuse and ability for something like uh, a man pad or a shoulder, shoulder fire missile um, uh, weapon uh, to be able to not stay in the hands to which it was intended. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, would you say the president's reaching a decision point on this? I'm not going to get ahead of either the chairman or the president on that. OK. And how much is the consideration of this also colored by the long-term association between the Ukrainian and Russian intelligence and military and the belief that there is still deep penetration of the Ukrainian intelligence and military services by the Russian counterparts? I think uh, as we do in other instances where we're dealing with a, a partner service or a service that we're going to provide assistance to, we're going to make very well sure uh, that we're confident uh, in uh, the ability of that service uh, to use that material and use it consistent uh, with the purpose for which it's intended. Now, Fran Townsend, one of your, one of your predecessors, actually, she didn't want to describe it herself, but in the conversation it came out that of course there are technical means to keep control of lethal weapons even after their transfer, whether to Syria or Syrian rebels or Ukrainian 
uh, military in terms of whether it's biometrics, whether it's GPS, the ability to, the minute it's transferred out of the right hands to essentially destroy it or shoot it out of the sky. Do you find those reassuring or not reassuring enough? Uh, I do, personally. I mean, I think we should be exploring uh, all of those types of options um, uh, to provide assistance where we need to, to go after uh, and uh, prevent the emergence of or the um, abuse of safe havens, whether it's in Ukraine, mm -hmm. whether it's in Syria or Iraq, uh, and where we can do so in a way that we have mitigated the risks, mm -hmm. uh, then I think we ought to look at that seriously. And so how, to what degree do you think the, mis the risks can be mitigated by this newer technology that, say, didn't exist back when we were giving shoulder-fired missiles to jihadis in Afghanistan? against the Soviet Union. Um, whether it's with that particular weapon or whether it's with other types of assistance, um, the ways you're going to mitigate risk are technology uh, by building relationships and having confidence and vetting uh, the people who are using uh, that material uh, and that know-how um, and uh, making sure that you've got oversight. So another big topic of this conference, right up your alley, combines the two is cybersecurity, of course. And uh, the 9-11 Commission, as you know, just did their sort of 10-year anniversary report. And quoting a lot of you, I'm sure you were interviewed by them too, said essentially we're at a pre-9-11 point in our preparations. It isn't that we're not observing the penetrations. So it's not pre-11-like in the sense of not just being clueless. We see the threat. We even see to a great degree the extent of the threat, but there is no coherent way of managing it, of dealing with it, of countering it. So, and former NSA Chief Keith Alexander has called it the greatest theft of intellectual property and in our wealth in his history. He didn't even make an intellectual. So I'm wondering what your strategy is for dealing with it. So uh, first of all, I, I agree with the, um, the sense that uh, this is uh, one of the foremost threats that we face today. I think it is real, it is present, and most importantly, it is growing. Uh, and uh, this is an area uh, that anyone you talk to uh, in the security space is going to tell you uh, they are most concerned about. Um, in terms of a strategy, we're doing a number of things that uh, first and foremost, we're gonna be focused on um, uh, protecting our critical infrastructure. Uh, now, what's interesting about this is, and folks probably have seen the statistic, 80% of the critical infrastructure that powers what we do um, is not, it's in, private hands. it's in private hands. It's not in federal government hands. Um, that means uh, our reliance on the private sector, unlike in combating a terrorist threat, uh, our reliance and our um, work with the private sector uh, has got to be at a premium. Uh, and it's something that I think we have made progress on in the last uh, several years, uh, particularly over the last year uh, in terms of sharing more and declassifying more information uh, and sharing it with the private sector so they can take steps to protect themselves and, as a consequence, protect our critical infrastructure. We've got to do more in that. We also have to do more, I think, uh, and another element of the strategy is, in essence, to raise all boats. We've got to increase, frankly, the cyber hygiene across, uh, across our uh, cyberspace uh, in this country. Um, Including the private absolutely. sector. So, you know, what we've done in that regard is, uh, and we announced this uh, last February, was the creation of a cybersecurity uh, framework. And this was developed with the private sector, and it's basically a set of best practices, which we would uh, then go and encourage the private sector to adopt. How much did the NSA re surveillance revelations by Edward Snowden set back that effort in terms of the trust between the private sector, and we, we've heard a lot about that yeah. up here. Yeah. I think that, um, look, there's, a, there's been a number of, uh, I think, unintended consequences from that. Most demonstrably, I would say, um, the ability to get information sharing legislation uh, through the Congress. Um, uh, that has always been a difficult 
issue, and there's uh, strongly held views on both sides of that issue. But uh, where I think we were making some progress, the spring of 2013, um, that, uh, that stalled considerably uh, after the Snowden revelations. And now these things are not um, uh, in, uh, these are not entirely the same issues, but I think it became uh, very difficult uh, and there was not a willingness in the Congress to, to address information sharing legislation uh, in the wake of the Snowden revelations. There have been a number of uh, suggestions made here, though, about how you could change structurally inside. Uh, Michael Leiter, former head of the National Counterterrorism Center, is among those who said, really, you should have, he didn't call it this, but a national cybersecurity center in which all the agencies and the private sector are at the table, not just for a meeting, but all the time, assessing the threat as, threats that, as they come in, and not operational, not with any ax to grind in terms of budget or, or operatives or whatever. Is there any serious thought being given to creating some kind of structure like that that so could serve then you all at the NSC by integrating all of this information and coming up with a consensus about it? So I think there's some wisdom in, uh, I think, the idea behind that, which is um, uh, co-locating and integrating people's efforts. This is um, one of the great lessons, I think, from our ability on the counterterrorism front that I think we need to apply, uh, and I think we need to do more of this, uh, applying the lessons we've learned over time in combating the terrorist threat to combating the cyber threat, uh, whether it's structurally, whether it's legally, whether it's in our relationships with the private sector. Um, these are things we have done, a, I think, a very good job over the last decade in building up structures, building up what I call muscle movement in ter and muscle memory in terms of responding to understanding a threat and then getting all elements of the government to address it and use one of any number of tools to disrupt that threat. So then why are we still at a pre-9-11 moment and getting ready for a cyber attack? Well, I think that there has been a growing uh, understanding and appreciation for the threat. Um, but it is much more difficult. Uh, there's, some, there's, some th there's some areas where I think the terrorism analogy is not as clean. So for instance, um, uh, an intrusion is not always susceptible, and rarely, quite frankly, is susceptible at first blush of knowing what the origin of that intrusion is. Uh, so is it a, a state actor? Is it a non-state actor? Is it a terrorist? Is it a kid sitting in his basement um, uh, becoming incredibly proficient uh, at hacking? And how we choose to deal with that threat, given the origin of it, will we'll take, uh, we'll take different forms. I should say, though, to this observation about a center, uh, people should not uh, think that there isn't that kind of work already uh, going on. That there is or isn't. That they should not think there isn't that kind of work so going on. So there is. And I should give a shout out uh, to my former boss, Bob Muller, for being a real visionary uh, in this area uh, in terms of setting up uh, a structure, something called the NCI JTF, where you have um, uh, analysts coming together from all the different agencies who deal with cyber threats to look at the cyber threat picture and understand it. And you see that evolving more towards really a center? I see that evolving into whether it's bricks and mortar or not uh, into an approach and it's something I'm trying to do in the National Security Council which is make sure we are bringing together when we face a cyber threat do we have everyone at the table? Literally, do mm -hmm. we have everyone at the table? Do we have a battle rhythm to say, all right, we're seeing this threat. What do we understand about it? What is the intelligence picture? Are we drawing from every um, element of the government who might have something to say and some knowledge about this threat? Let's assess it. Now let's figure out how we can go out and disrupt that. Is it, what tool in our arsenal should we be using? You know, your, your mention of having everyone at the table reminds me, and this goes more to the Snowden NSA surveillance question. As Stan Charney from Microsoft, who I gather you worked with at the Justice Department long ago with Janet Reno, was talking about, this was on a panel about the le both the legality and wisdom of the whole NSA surveillance program. And there were several 
panelists and got to Stan and he said, uh, well, we keep hearing the same arguments that it was all legal and it was approved by the courts and blah, 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 blah. He said, but we never hear about the broader national security interest. That is, that in the conversation about whether to do it, whether, as he put it, to scarf up all the data we can, there was no one at the table saying, well, what about our global IT business and does our national security rely on it continuing to be the most competitive and dominant industry in the world. He said, so it was never even put in the calculus. Does he have a point? So I'd say a few things in this regard, and some of which the president has already said, which is in, re in re response most directly to your question. Um, uh, yeah, he does have a point. And one of the things that I think we've learned and one of the pieces of reforms that the president put in place and announced uh, in January at his speech at the Justice Department was, frankly, uh, having to insert more policy level consideration uh, into decisions about what and where uh, to undertake uh, this type of signals intelligence activity. Now, you had my colleague Rick Leggett um, uh, on this stage uh, a short while ago, so he's going to be much more expert at this, but I'll give you my perspective, which is that uh, we were operating, I think, in a realm that we did not conceive of, quite frankly, um, sufficiently, that this information would get out into the public realm. Uh, and so we did not undertake uh, the type of cost-benefit analysis, which is really what Scott is talking about, um, whether it's foreign policy implications, mm -hmm. whether it's economic uh, implications or ramifications for our businesses, what element in the equation of deciding how to go out and get this intelligence, what element does that factor in? And we didn't have that sufficiently weighted into the balance. And what the president has said is, now we're going to do that, and we are doing it. So, so you're doing it in that kind of a case, but are, is there a broader lesson from that about when you're considering any of these elements of national security or homeland security or surveillance? that you just need more players at the table, you need more perspectives. So I think it was, it's both perspective and it's practice and procedure. There was no, frankly, procedure uh, to get that um, uh, senior level. I should say there was policymaker input to uh, the uh, intelligence that is gathered by the intelligence community and the, you know, the notion that NSA is a rogue entity I would like to, um, to really dispel. No one in this room has said that. Right. Well, <laughs> it, it, it has been out there, um, and I really do want to take the opportunity to dispel that. These are patriotic, dedicated men and women who have um, uh, been doing their work at the behest of policymakers, going out and seeking information that they have been told is of interest to those policymakers. Now, what we needed to do, though, is get those senior level policymakers engaged in saying, What's the cost benefit, and do you really want this uh, as against the risk to it? We want to go to audience questions. I want to ask you one other thing that came up, especially with General Dempsey, and that is the perception of U.S. weakness and unwillingness to act abroad by President Obama. And I'm, I'm wondering, just from your homeland security counterterrorism perspective, whether you think that perception, fair or unfair, adversely affects the U.S. ability to work with partners in the region to combat terrorism? So uh, I think that um, it is not an accurate um, perception. Um, and from my but seat- But it is out there. It is out there. For sure it's out there. Um, but from my seat, um, whether it's in uh, daily meetings in the sit room or in the Oval Office, um, uh, there is- um, nothing approaching disengagement. And you see that in, just take a scan of uh, the world here and look at the facts on the ground. In uh, Israel, Secretary Kerry is trying to mediate a ceasefire. Um, in Ukraine, the US is leading the way in explaining here's what happened and how it happened and in garnering, garnering the Europeans uh, and uh, to try and isolate Putin. Uh, in Syria, trying to work with partners to bolster uh, the moderate opposition. We've talked about Iraqi government formation, leading talks uh, uh, with Iran uh, to staunch the nuclear program there. In every place you look, there's American leadership, and people are crying for American leadership, and it's present, 
uh, and the president is uh, hyper-engaged, frankly, from the seat that I see him in. But you do hear from people overseas, like the Saudis and others, that they doubt U.S. resolve. But let me go to questions. Because, all right, right over here, lady in blue. Oh, I recognize her now, but <laughs> all I saw was the blue. I'm so stumped. Okay, Catherine Harridge, Fox News. Lisa, thank you for doing this. Uh, I have some detention-related questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the administration is very committed to the law enforcement model. Did you get everything that you could from the Benghazi suspect in those 10 days on the USS New York? And second, will the administration close Guantanamo by the end of the second term? Thank you. Uh, on the last part, um, the president uh, is as serious uh, about closing Guantanamo as anything. Uh, and I can tell you it's something that he um, is pushing his team on uh, daily. Um, now, uh, there's a, quite a number of restrictions in law uh, that are preventing um, uh, him from being able to accomplish that task, but uh, nobody should doubt his resolve on that. Um, with regard to, I think you're referencing the capture of Abu Qatala um, pursuant to um, a charging document from the Justice Department. Uh, I'm not gonna get into uh, the particulars of uh, the uh, interrogation and debriefing of him, given that it's obviously a, a pending case. But I can tell you that the first and foremost um, uh, focus uh, of this administration is to get intelligence first um, and that there is mechanisms uh, that are in place and that have been put to use, not just in that case, but in every one uh, that we've employed that I've been a part of uh, to ensure that that happens. As you follow up, I'd like to ask to Kathy's question, which has to do with Guantanamo. When U.S. major part of U.S. forces leave Afghanistan at the end of the year, will there be any reason to have the AUMF continue? And if so, then under what basis will you be able to hold, continue to hold anyone at Guantanamo? Yeah. So it's an interesting question and one that um, is going to be the subject of, I think, a lot of uh, debate and discussion over the, over the coming months and one that I have personally been engaging members uh, of Congress on. Um, there is nothing in the AUMF statute that um, is a time delimiter on it. If folks have read it, it's quite brief, but it does not um, uh, speak to any time uh, limitation. So, um, uh, you know, there is... Uh, there's nothing to say. I think you might have some arguments about whether or not, uh, and now I'm drawing on my former legal training, so um, I'm a recovering lawyer, as many know. Um, uh, to the extent we're no longer in a conflict with the Taliban, there may not be a basis to, to hold those or individuals. Or related to 9-11 or even associated with groups that are associated with those groups. But to, to your question of, is there a reason to have an AUMF, whether it's the 2001 mm -hmm. AUMF, mm -hmm. I think is something that we'll have discussions about. I think there absolutely is a uh, reason to have an authority to enable us to um, uh, take the fight to uh, these evolving terrorists that we've talked about. So um, the threat from core Al-Qaeda is greatly degraded. Mm -hmm. And what we're now facing, as has been remarked upon, I think probably ad nauseum over the last few days, is the emergence of uh, affiliates, um, uh, the emergence on the one hand of affiliates and the greater um, uh, determination of, of groups like AQAP. And we need to continue to have an authority to go after them. Uh, question back here, way in the back. Labbit with CNN, thank you. Um, a quick clarification and a question. On the, on the Ukrainian uh, separatists, how do, does the U.S. classify them as terrorists? I mean, should they be dealt with through a counterterrorism paradigm? Because I think that would open up a lot of questions about whether Russia is a state sponsor of terrorism. Mm -hmm. um, you, there's been so much talk about um, Westerners that are going to uh, join the jihadist movement and come back throughout this whole conference. Could you talk a little bit more about what you're doing to prevent them from coming back? Are we just left with the TSA? Do you have the resources that you need? Do you have enough Arabic speakers? Do we need more human intelligence on the ground um, in neighboring countries to make sure that we have a better handle on that? Thank you. So on the last piece, um, look, I, I think uh, more, more human intelligence, more um, 
uh, information from our partners, that's all going to be to the good. So you're not going to find anyone in my job who doesn't want more intelligence uh, on that problem. Uh, in terms of what are we doing uh, to ensure that uh, those foreign fighters aren't getting uh, on planes and coming here, uh, it is a real uh, concern when you're dealing with Western passport holders and those who are um, uh, holding passports, particularly from visa waiver countries. Uh, so uh, that, that means the premium is put on the ability to share information amongst governments so that they know, when the French know, for instance, that one of their citizens has traveled to Syria and traveled back and that their services, we're going to be relying on their services uh, to make sure that they're sharing with us information about that individual before he gets on a plane uh, to come here. Now, one topic I didn't get to, but I, has come up a lot, so I'm going to encourage audience questions. I'm looking at Diana Negroponte right now, which has to do with the whole border unaccompanied minors, which is in Lisa's portfolio. So would you like to ask a question? <laughs> I don't usually call on people, but <laughs> you have a compelling one. Ms. Monaco, I would, I'm Diana Negroponte from the Woodrow Wilson Center for International Scholars and I'm a scholar there. There has been talk in the front page of the New York Times yesterday about the establishment of a detention center or holding center in Honduras in order to process the potential refugees. Could you elaborate further upon that report? Sure, thanks for the question actually. Um, this is something, and the president met with the leaders uh, of uh, Central American nations yesterday from Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, and this was an issue that he addressed. Uh, that, um, uh, with all due respect to um, uh, the, uh, the, all the news that's fit to print in the New York Times, that article was a bit overcranked, uh, which is uh, something the president addressed, uh, which is to say that um, to the extent that we can create uh, a way to process uh, in an orderly fashion uh, claims for refugee status uh, in country, then we will try and do that. But there should not be uh, any illusion that that is going to be um, a kind of free pass uh, up to the border. We suspect that that'll be a very small number of, uh, of people who actually come in that route. But the notion is you want to uh, make clear that there is an orderly way to seek, whether it's refugee status or asylum, and that people shouldn't be making, and families shouldn't, frankly, be paying up to $7,000 to smugglers to put their kids on what is in, an incredibly dangerous and at times deadly journey uh, up to our southern border. Do you agree with Jay Johnson, who thought, he said that the numbers had peaked at, on June 10th, and that not that every day they go down, but that the trend line was down because you've been able to surge resources to this issue. Do you share that view, and how dependent is it on continued funding from, uh, or the increased funding that the president's asked for from Congress? So um, we have seen, I mean, the numbers are clear. We've seen um, a diminishment in uh, the apprehensions over the last uh, uh, a couple of weeks. We cannot be sure and we can't declare victory and there's no um and we can't con frankly take our foot off the gas in in addressing this problem so we can't be sure that that's going to be sustained um which is why uh, we need uh, both to have searched the resources we have to deal with this issue uh, and are seeking the resources that we're very hopeful that congress uh, will act on uh, to help us address this problem any other audience questions because i have one if oh, oh yes right here sir Craig Perso, just very quick, where is Mexico in the conversation around the border challenge? Um, they've been a, a very a willing and helpful partner, and the president has been uh, has talked to President Peña Nieto several times. Uh, I've talked to my uh, counterpart at the Ministry of Interior there several times. Uh, they are doing a taking a number of steps to address their own southern border, uh, which is uh, a key factor. Them getting ahead of that and getting control on their southern border is a direct, uh, uh, has direct effect on our ability uh, to address uh, folks making this very dangerous journey. There was a question in the back. Yes, sir.
Hi, thanks for this really interesting conversation. Uh, Raha Walla, Human Rights First. Um, so I wanted to follow up on something that I think you said uh, a couple minutes ago about counterterrorism authorities. Um, you said that, uh, I think you said that uh, there absolutely does need to be an authority um, to deal with emerging threats. I wanted to ask you to clarify whether you meant by that um, a federal statutory use of force authority or some other authority, and if it's the former, uh, in other words, another AUMF or a new AUMF, um, how such an authority would be consistent with the president's um, commitment uh, that he gave in, in, uh, at the National Defense University in, in May of last year to um, get off a permanent war footing for dealing with terrorism and um, not sign into law any legislation that would uh, expand or um, increase the AUMF's mandate. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, it's a really good question, and it, and it bespeaks a very difficult uh, path we need to tread. So the 2001 AUMF um, has uh, provided uh, us authority to go after uh, uh, terrorist actors uh, and address the threats that they pose that fit within that uh, definition. We are now 13, 14 years on from that, and we're seeing the emergence uh, of other actors. The president said at NDU was that he wanted to refine and ultimately repeal that authority. Um, it does not mean, however, that we wouldn't want to seek uh, a narrowed, potentially narrowed version of that uh, to allow us to go after and address emerging terrorist threats uh, that uh, may not come under uh, this current 2001 uh, authority, because uh, I think it is his preference to always be acting um, with uh, congressional and statutory authority when at all possible. Have you started those discussions with Congress? Yes. Yep. So that's very much in the works. It is. Well, we are out of, oh, are we totally out of time? Yes, I'm told we're, <laughs> well, well, we could ask these two guys two to ask really short questions. Do you want to take uh, one to give more really question? short answers? Bang, bang, but they have to be very short questions. And the gentleman in the back in the red shirt. You know me in the short question. Yeah, yeah. Steve, uh, short. Hi, Lisa, thank you. Hey. A quick question about HVE, CVE, combating violent extremism at home. Mm -hmm. And from the National Security Council perspective, I know that the office that dealt with uh, violent extremism, on, uh, there was an office. It was under Q, and it got moved around. Q left, and it was under your office, and then it got switched over to... Uh, Amy Pope's office on, on border, and it sort of doesn't have its own title any longer, and, and it gets that kind of reaction when I ask other people. Yeah. So uh, just curious, could you talk about how the government is structuring itself? I don't mean how difficult it is to go find it. Yes, I know that. But how the government is structuring itself to, to approach this. Are we still using the U.S. attorneys? Are we, are mm -hmm. we trying to reach out to the Bureau? Uh, how does the NSC structure itself for this? Thank you. And then the gentleman in the red shirt, and then so you can just take them both. Sure. Because we are out of time. Okay. Lisa, in July 2012, the White House issued a national strategy on biosurveillance and set a deadline of 120 days for implementation. And just last month, um, the head of the Office of Health Affairs at DHS said that implementation plan is still being worked on. Doesn't that blow through the, your own White House deadline create the impression that bioterrorism, biosurveillance just isn't that important when racked and stacked against other things? And why has it taken two years to get it out the door? It's a good question, uh, and one uh, that I also intend to answer for the members of Congress who wrote me the same letter with the same question. So, um, but uh, uh, <laughs> with, with respect to Steve's question, I know we're, we're running short on time. Um, very quickly, yes, um, through the U.S. attorneys as being kind of the convening body uh, across, uh, across state and local communities, uh, they uh, can serve a unique function in bringing together both community representatives, law enforcement, uh, and uh, other elements of the community, medical professionals uh, and others, et cetera. So that is the kind of governing structure uh, with, with the communities. And do you want to say anything more to, about the bio? Terror. I, well, I would question the premise that um, uh, it's not a priority um, because a, a certain deadline hasn't been met. Um, you know, what we've done uh, just on the global health security agenda alone uh, in, um, in galvanizing international um, uh, focus on that issue, and we'll be hosting a White House uh, summit on that in September, I think uh, shows the, the focus that the president's paying to that. 
Well, Lisa Monaco, I want to thank you very much. Very thank informative, you. even if you didn't make big news. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thanks.